I started writing poetry, this will sound crazy to you, because it was trash uh, when I was about nine years old. And uh, I wrote uh, actively if in, a, in a cave on the Winnipeg County up north of here. Uh, I, I wrote actively in, in this cave and, and I had a stub and, some, uh, uh, and a few scraps of paper and so forth uh, and uh, some candles as I stuck on the side of the cave I was in and uh, decided I was a poet. <laughs> this, is, this is from age nine o'clock on, which is all just you know nonsense and fancy and nothing more. And, and uh, so I, just for the fun of it, I brought along, I, I, had, I wrote a whole bunch of poems. They're all, as I said, a lot of them are trash. Some of them are not quite, but uh, so I put it all together. This, this is what I, material I wrote between age nine and, nine and nine, 19. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm both uh, astonished and embarrassed by looking at it from time to time now. But then I thought, well, uh, I'd just really like to talk to you uh, about poetry. And so I, I'd start with uh, some experiences that all of you have had at one time or another, certainly. And one of, this poem is called Lost Faces. And the reason I call it that is that uh, I've been, you see, many times I've thought of ideas. They're not new with me at all about how many people we, we came on the verge of meeting and we thought, wow, I really wish I had introduced myself to her or to him or to them and I didn't quite do it somehow. And now in retrospect, I think, wow, I missed that, so forth. I should have, should have done so. And the more I thought about that, see, the idea is not mine. The idea is not new. I, j I just thought, well, I'll set it in Spring Grove, Minnesota in my own case, and uh, it's just rounding the street corner and just missing a, a hello somehow to a girlfriend that I regretted for years afterwards. And, uh, and I thought, well, this sort of thing, it, it happens in all sorts of ways, it happens to all of us one time or another. What was the moment when you, you lost or you passed, you missed out, you didn't respond to and so I started writing this poem, uh, Lost Faces. Then, turning the corner of our little town in southeastern Minnesota, I came upon your face aloft in light, held to a shadowed angle of the sun. I had never met you before, never in all the world, but there you were, there in our little town, as though you had always been walking there up and down. Nothing seemed out of place. Your dress, your hair, the color of your eyes, the contours of your face. It was so absolute, so natural a grace that there was no surprise. Only by chance, some recognition in your glance that made a usual day of wind and sun with white clouds drifting in the sky so strangely natural that we seemed to step right from the sidewalk to each other's arms. Although we scarcely stopped a moment there, no more, and barely touched each other, passing through a door of shade and sunlight hinged upon our hands, took a few troubled steps, looked backwards, but at different times, and went on to our private lands. It was as though the troubled heart had sent a frontier expedition from its breast across the Mississippi going west and rode the far Dakota's mound and plain, 2,000 miles of wilderness and rain, while all the sky, abstracted in its own renown to one blue eye, sent back into my heart and to my town only its mute report, as though eternity had made a stop somewhere west of the mountains, where the mind, body, and heart might sit on a sunny headland, gazing out past rock and mist and wave of what we are and seem upon some blue Pacific like a dream. 
Well, that's just a, a representation then of just a, a, what could be any sort of common experience to any people, any of you. I'm sure some of you could, could have some that would just simply pick up that, that theme uh, or that, that idea of just lost faces or things we have met. Well, there, there's so many place I could, uh, places I can go on to from them, and so I'll go back to the home farm in northeastern Iowa. I, I lived there till I was through high school, <clears throat> and then I've been gone, actually. It's until uh, about a year ago, been gone all the intervening time. And uh, there are so many, I, I lived with a lot of animals. I'm one of nine children in the family. And uh, of course, I had lots, a lot of experiences on the farm with the animals and horses and so forth. And I must say that I, I read some of them to a, a well-known poet from New York City who'd never been on a farm. And he wrote to another well-known poet living in Seattle, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, that uh, he said that I was sadistic and masochistic on the basis of, because I wrote all these poems about uh, farmers, you know, uh, cutting down their fields, killing them, so forth, raising pigs, sheep, lambs, chickens, everything, killing them all, or, or send them to be killed for all of you to eat, all of us to eat. And so, and, and, uh, so uh, that, I got all involved in that in one way or another. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll uh, just jump into, uh, well, there, there's so many places I could go at this point. Well, I was going to say a poem about sandhill cranes. We used to have some that would show up around the cricks in northeastern Iowa. And uh, the, then uh, there's, there's a fellow, a, a great person working for the, the whole outdoor world, uh, he, he worked, uh, he'd saved some crane eggs in Oregon from a flood, and he'd hatched them, two of them, and when they were born, uh, or in the setting he'd set up, he was the only one there, and they, they lived with him for a while. They adopted him as their mother, and uh, just whenever he let them loose, they followed him. And uh, so when I was teaching uh, one summer at the, University of Oregon, just a course in poetry and the, and the various popular lyrics for songs. Of why you have, I, have, I was invited by him to come down to his ranch and uh, spend some time with him. And, and uh, because he had seen my poem, Crane, and, uh, and I had uh, been reading his book. And so I went down there, and then it, one, one morning, it's a big ranch on the upper Williamson River in Oregon. Uh, one morning, we, uh, we got up rather early, as, as we usually did anyway, before we went out to look at the herds. Uh, and uh, he took me out to where he had two cranes, in a, two big cranes in a pen. When they stood, you know, they're, they're my height, pray. Uh, and, uh, so uh, he, he got out a little food, and then he opened the pen, and, and one of them stood right in front of him there, and then another one was standing, right, well, I was standing next to him, so it was be, before us both. And he started waving his hands and dancing there in front of them, and, uh, and so I started doing the same. And so because of this poem, I have danced with a sandhill crane in Oregon. And, and that's, that's the result result of it. And so that's just one of so many aspects I could get into. But I'm going to now jump to just fishing in Iowa. And uh, it's the, the North Bear, which is well known as a, as a rather famous place for Iowans to fish. And, and uh, that's going fishing, you know, with a willow pole and, a, and, a, and an old pin that's been bent and with an angle worm and so forth. You catch these sort of uh, I know we call them rainbows, but they weren't authentic rain, reindeer trout. And, and so uh, I'll sit down from time to time. Uh, I, I wrote the poem. It, it, if you've seen Living with Iowa, I've been on that program and on it, 
I, I used that poem also once upon a time, a few years back. But at any rate, so I'm just thinking about this and saying, suddenly from a rocky spring, a trout hung trembling in the air, a jewel to the morning sun. And then upon the mossy banks, rainy with rainbows, up he leaped and tumbled wildly in the grass. I ran to catch him where the rocks turned him around. Oh, oh goodness, I was in. It passed a, a, a crusted rock and ripped his mouth and gills apart. And I pulled his foaming stomach clean, then washed my fingers in the spring, and wrapped his flesh in leaves of elm, and homeward singing carried him. It goes on, on like that. And, but I just want to say that for me, from way, way back when I was practically a baby, it almost seems to me, I, I like to hear a lot of music. And I like to, to hear people speaking sometimes with a kind of music, you know the kind. Uh, you could sit back yourself and think of, well, do I like to hear her talk or him talk and so forth? And how did it, uh, how did it sound? And why do I remember him as I do remember a Mr. Pierce instead of a Mr. Patterson who both lived on the same farm? One was lovely to hear because because of the voice, and so I, I hear music in that thing all the time. And so I, the more I hear these things, the more I think, well, uh, I'd like to I have some music. And the more I hear them, I, I, and even my own poems, uh, I make up tunes. Not that they're any good, but I have been lucky enough to have uh, a number of famous composers, like Martin Gould and so forth, set poems of mine to music and so forth. And uh, uh, so uh, I even going around the farm when I was a youngster, I used to sing all the way walking one mile to school. Not that the singing was any good or any, anything else, but suddenly from a rocky spring, a trout hung trembling in the air, a jewel to the morning sun. And then upon the mossy banks, rainy with rainbows, up he leaped and tumbled wildly in the grass. I ran to catch him where my hook pinned him behind a crusted rock and ripped his mouth and gills apart. I pulled his foaming stomach clean, then washed my fingers in the spring and sat down and admired him. His sunlit scales upon my hands, I wrapped his flesh in leaves of elm and homeward singing carried him. I stripped him of his ivory bones, then held him shining to the fire, and tongued his body to my own. And that was the supper that I had, while my imagination fed its silver hook upon this world. Well, at least you could see it, at least as you, know, you, you might be thinking it was this or something else. Or even, even for if you have some favorite songs or favorite words, some of them you like, you like to repeat and so forth. And, and many times I made up stuff like that, it was no good at all. I slept, we were uh, a family of uh, nine children, mother and dad, 11 of us. We slept in three bedrooms at, at night where we'd make up songs and so forth or tell stories. And usually when I made up a story, I would sing the story. Uh, if it's not that the music was any good at all, but it just uh, it, it gets to be a habit. That's that's all about that. And at any rate, I, I now that's this sort of I don't I don't mean to sort of take you astray, but I know that uh, is, is with with you that various kinds of music I don't know just what is what is most popular now so far it, it invades you from time to time or you invade it. And, and you use it. And uh, I do think that in poetry, it is very important that you have a real sense of the, the sound of the different syllabic parts of what you are saying. And that uh, I, I could use one of my own poems, but uh, well, let's, let's see. Uh, what's the best approach to that? Well, I'll just uh, go astray for a while. Astray means t 
to the poetry of Robert Frost. You may have to, have to have studied him. But uh, I, I got to know him moderately well and see him from time, time to time. I used to roll the tennis courts at Breadloaf in Vermont so that he could play tennis at 6 o'clock in the morning, even, uh, something like that. And uh, so I'll, I'll say a little poem as we're approaching the first snowfall. It's on the way. And so uh, uh, this is I, uh, one of his poems. It's, it's about it's a man and woman, an older man and woman. They're just heading north into Vermont, and they see a, a, one of these Morgan Colts. And uh, the, th that's all. Once, when the snow of the year was beginning to fall, we stopped at a mountain pasture to say, who's Colt? A little Morgan had one forefoot on the wall, the other curled at his breast. He dipped his head and snorted at us, and then he had to bolt. We heard the miniature thunder when he fled, and we saw him, or thought we saw him, dim and gray like a shadow against the curtain of falling flakes. I'm going to go back there now to say and we saw him, or thought we saw him, dim and gray like a shadow against the curtain of falling flakes. Frost loved all these different syllabic tones. And I could just sound them out syllabically, too. But, but after, after you read him a while, and, and, uh, and many, many good poets, uh, you get aware of, the, of this. Uh, and then, of course, the, the man speaks up. I think the little fellow is afraid of the snow. And there, once again, you recognize natural speech rhythm. It's wonderful when uh, many, many of the best poets are able to incorporate natural speech rhythms into some of their best poems. I think the little fellow's afraid of the snow. He isn't winter broken. It isn't play with the little fellow at all. He's running away. I doubt that even his mother could tell him, sakes, it's only weather. He'd think she didn't know. Where is his mother? He can't be gone alone. And now he comes again with clatter of stone. And of course, it's this one, ow, ah, eh, eh, oh. That's the sound. Now he comes again with clatter of stone and mounts the wall again with whited eyes and all his tail that isn't hair up straight. He shudders his coat as if to throw off flies. It's, all that is it's rich in sound. He shudders his coat as if to throw off flies. Whoever it is that leaves him out so late, or where is, where is his mother? He can't be out alone when other creatures have gone to stall and bin. Who, 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 whoever, whoever left him out ought to be told to come and take him in or bring him in. Well, so many people sit down to a poem, and then, of course, it's quiet in a library or someplace, and they just uh, sit down and, and they, they eyeball the poem. There's this, the eye goes down. And many people just, they see, they, they see the intellectual content, and that's all, and they don't hear anything. And uh, that's, that's a huge loss in, in poetry, if it, if it should happen like that. And so, uh, uh, at any rate, I'd, I'd just like to, like to stress that because so many people think that just you write poems to sit down and record the ideas. Now, that's a great thing to do. And a sociologist, uh, 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 an uh, economist, they're doing that and doing a good job, and that's, good. that's a great thing to do. That's what they want to do, primarily. But if you just uh, record it, I'll give you the first line of the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. This is a hundred, per if you had a test as to content of the meaning, it's a, I'll, my first line I'll give you is 100% correct of what exactly he said. There's the Gettysburg Address. Now remember the occasion and all. Here's the president standing up, and and I, I did you have him say, 87 years ago our granddaddies came over here and made a government where every guy was just as good as the next guy. 
That's, if you're graded on content, ideas, you, you, A plus. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation dedicated to liberty and the proposition that all men are created equal, you know. And, and so, I, well, you hear something there then, and, and say, and so uh, that's the trouble with sitting down in the absolutely, of course, after a while, sometimes uh, you can hear what you even see. I've known musicians who say, I don't need to go to concerts because all I do is I, say, I look at the score and I hear the whole thing and it's all perfectly done. I knew such uh, a person, a head of a music department in a leading university. Uh, but uh, so, uh, so you have eyeballed the poem and then they say, a teacher will ask you, did you, did you read this, did you read this poem? Have you gone, yeah, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, done that. that. And what the hell did you hear? You know, just uh, something like that. Well, now, there are, uh, I, I feel like saying there are a hundred directions in which we could go, and, and uh, really, if we had a lot of time, you know, and, and there were other times, so forth, why well, I would like to be talking with you and not only at you, because, but uh, I feel we're sort of caught in a situation like this, and it, this is Veterans Day, I mean, it's, the 11th of November. I have spent four or five years in the Army myself in World War II, and uh, several members of my family. I had a younger brother who was killed in World War II, and another brother working with the Air Force uh, in, in Europe in World War II. I was everything from a uh, just a private to a captain in the, in the infantry in World War II. And uh, then I was somewhere on the east banks of the Rhine River when I get an e uh, uh, and one of the special airmail letters from my mother saying that my younger brother, Harold, who went to high school in Decorah, had been, kill been killed. And, uh, there's, there's another strange thing, and, and we're talking about feelings and so forth. If you're a, a captain in an infantry, uh, it, you're a captain in a company, and no matter what happens, we've been through lots of terrible things, coming off Normandy and up through the Battle of the Bulls and whatnot. And, uh, but at any rate, when I got this, I, I, if you're, if you're a, a captain, you're not, you don't show your emotion. You don't, uh, you don't rejoice when people might rejoice, and you don't, you don't shed tears uh, no matter what happens, because you have to be a model of somehow for your soldiers. And so I just had to tell the sergeant in charge, sir, I just have to go away for a few hours, and went back as near the Rhine River, and just lay down. Uh, in the, the Green Bank of the, the Rhine River. It's, it's the first knowledge of the death of Harold. And I started thinking, I finished this poem years afterwards in this country because I'd gotten a lot of information of what the other members of the family had done and when they had first discovered this. When my young brother was killed by a mute and dusty shell in the thorny brush, crowning the boulders of the Villa Verde Trail on the island of Luzon, I laid my whole dry body down like a stone on the east banks of the Rhine. On an airstrip skirting the sand, his sergeant brother sat like a stick in his barracks while cracks of fading sunlight caged the dusty air. And in the rocky, rolling hills west of the Mississippi, his father and mother sat in a simple Norwegian parlor with a photograph 
smiling between them on the table, and their hands fallen into their laps like sticks and dust. And still other brothers and sisters, linking their arms together, walk down the dusty road where once he ran and into that deep green valley to sit on the stony banks of the stream he loved and let those murmuring waters wash over their blood-hot feet with a springing crown of tears. Well, I wrote 10, 15 more poems for him, but that's sometime after, afterwards, and that, this is the only poem, really, that... But I have to say something about po poetry now, and I'm talking about all the arts. And that is that uh, uh, the arts have a way of just breaking across international boundaries and language and so forth and speaking. And, and, and uh, so this poem, a person uh, came to this country from Germany afterwards. He was an officer in the infantry of the uh, uh, Hitler's Nazi group. He came to this country afterward and studied music, and he saw this poem. And he said it to me, music. And so I was there fighting the Germans, a German officer who came to this country and to study music, has set my poem to music. It has been translated into some other languages. I'm not, not talking about myself, really. I'm just talking about the, the ways in which many of the fine arts have a way of just stepping across boundaries. The first three translations of it into another foreign language were into German and Italian and Japanese. Those were the three countries we were fighting in World War II. And uh, then uh, even when the Russians crushed the Hungarians in Budapest after the war, uh, someone there had found the poem, a Hungarian, and it got translated into the Hungarian language and was distributed in the streets of Budapest. Some, I found this out way later. The streets. Uh, so that's another example of the art just going across the political scene in, in many different ways. And, uh, and I, I wish to also say that when I say that, going across the, the boundaries, the political boundaries, they, uh, many, many uh, poems that are good just cross the boundaries of sort of human uh, affiliations, ideas, or feelings. And uh, not, not, not everything appeals, but that's just part of it. Well, then uh, something is a little bit more drastic because you all heard about the concentration camps. And uh, so I, th I thought, well, I'll... Uh, I can find what I'm looking for. Uh, just one poem. I was in Buchenwald concentration camp at the end of the war, helping to take care of the, some of the survivors of that concentration camp. And I was in the crematorium where they burned, burned the bodies and, and even saw some of, a number of the naked bodies lying in back of the crematorium stacked up ready, to, getting ready to be burned uh, sometime. I didn't write anything about that for about 15 years. Uh, but uh, then, then I fin finally did. And so uh, uh, here once again, it's uh, uh, suggested that, uh, that, that I, uh, I read it. But I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it immediately yet. Uh, at hand. Just excuse me a moment. 26. I, I had been, uh, uh, we were on Nietzsche Strasse in Weimar, Germany at the, at the time of the armistice, and that, that night everybody got drunk, including me, and we were right outside the, uh, one of the leading German cemeteries in Weimar. And so I just left the country, uh, the company and uh, went down early the next morning 
into the graveyard to the graveyard of Goethe and Schiller, two of the great German poems. And this morning, after all these experiences, you know, where you are supposed to not to even show your emotions, I just lay down by the graveyard of those two for about half an hour and wept. It just seemed, because just that previous morning, I'd been sent out, of course, to the concentration camp to just see what we could do for, oh, a Two, three hundred people that were still there. They all looked like they were dying. Finally, I wrote this. Through barbed wire enclosures, their bodies bloodless under metallic thorns, like an unauthorized crucifixion. The animal faces of handsome Europe st steered and grinned and begged and leered. They had piled some bodies up, naked to God like cordwood for a fire. If eyes and faces turned or jaws hung out among the shriveled limbs, they sang, thank God, no hymns. Pallid with black dishonor, nailed to the numerous numerals of striped uniforms, stripped of their native hair, they snared me with their unashamed display and mocked at my dismay. A rapid, frantic babbling I took for a Slavic tongue, a complete stranger, but a wrinkled skeleton wavered up to the air and whispered in English, his mind is sick. In anguish, the proud white brow of man where the eye nobly shines had crashed down. It groveled on the ground, more than Greece falling, more than Rome, raised in its charred home. The low gray barracks stood dumb in a chained line in the torn up land. The bleak doggy eyes rolled to and fro, compounded with despair, blind to the exit there. I could not touch them. I could not ask forgiveness, not even comfort them. I came from another land and stood at the deathbed of my own father again in that vast, mad graveyard of falling men. Well, maybe get off that subject. I wrote a poem for Sadako Sasaki, the Japanese girl who was not too far from the center of the atomic bomb when it fell and, and was injured enough in her body so when she was 12 years old, she died. And she, uh, they, they raised money for a statue. And if any of you have been to Hiroshima, uh, you will know that in the Peace Park in Hiroshima, there's a statue of Sadako Suzaki. And, uh, and I will also say that now when the music comes along, uh, I just, just used the, uh, uh, the, the, the oriental scale, the four-tone scale, and made up a, a song for it. I'm not going to sing it. And it's been set to music by two people who wrote uh, music for ballad. And it's uh, been composed and performed otherwise. But in other words, this, in other words, music has just come along. And, and of course, this is something very direct and, and desperate and, and awful and all that so forth. And yet, yet it's, a, it's an art form. And then along comes another art form and embrace, embraces it. Several people actually wrote, wrote music for that because they, well, they just felt that this should, this should be, I guess, that's it. Oh, now, I know time is just going and so that uh, uh, I just, uh, I should pause and ask if any of you want to interrupt or ask him because unfortunately there's a huge amount of uh, material here that things we could talk about. And uh, certainly a number of things I could say. I tell you that every morning when I wake up in the morning, I say some poems by other poets. 
I'm just uh, it's part of my waking up. So I get get into a whole series of physical exercises. Uh, I have bump knees, but on my back I just kick and uh, the air and everything else, and uh, uh, and and then uh, then maybe uh, when I crawl in the car, just sing something. But uh, I am a farm boy, see, and uh, I, I just learned that when I was a kid, to to just sort of reach reach out in all these sorts of ways, and. Uh, and uh, and not that I was good. I, I was good at music or or art or poetry. Then, I, uh, but uh, they were something that were just simply cutting across all my daily life, including my associations with uh, all sorts of people, so forth. Not to mention animals, and uh, and, and then the arts just came as a. As a as a nice substitute for it. That's another reason why I was really interested in forming in a major university of, of the, of the, the whole arts program in, in all the different uh, aspects, writing, poetry, and, and going into music and the arts also. They, they exist as a kind of periphery uh, around us in all sorts of ways. Well, now, uh, just interrupt me if, if you want about any anything, because uh, I have many subjects. But uh, I'll say another another thing that uh, I had uh, done done a, a poem about uh, the nature of love and. Uh, it's really, I, I wrote it for my wife. Wouldn't have had to have been for my wife, but uh, at, uh, at any rate, it's, it's about just the physical relationship to the sort of musical sense of it. And it's been set to music by the head of the music department at a major university now. And uh, the thing that has brought it to some prominence in Decora recently is that one person, well known in Nicora. I was first told this by his wife. Uh, his wife said he'd wa awakened her in the middle of the night about midnight because he was whispering in her ear this poem. And uh, this, this poem begins, that was the, they are married, and they, that, but uh, this poem begins, your warm skin is an old road under my hands, as mine and yours, as, and so forth. If I if I wakened you deep in your ear, and then hear me out in my watery songs while your fronds of hair wave like lilies over the traveled sea. Though body aches, body is lovely still. Music of muscle and timpani of bones, reeds and the gut strung frets of mind. Wound to a pulse of bellows, the blood follows its blue arterials into the veins of earth. And if the heart, that live volcano, troubles the lost and soft subcontinents for love, let it burst at last if it must. Somewhere an old horn blows forever new by a dark cave in luminous passages. Though blood, the blood rises and floods the body's shore, let it burst at last, if it must. Somewhere an old horn blows forever new by a dark cave filled in numinous passages that feed at last upon this ancient sea. The blood rises, it floods the body's shore, and congeals to grains of salt in a bed of sand, asleep in the ear of Circe, like a shell. Well, you can say that's a sexy poem. It is a, it is a sexy poem. And, uh, and uh, as I discovered earlier, later, because they told me so, uh, <laughs> the, 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 he was using the poem to awaken his wife so they could have sex. Uh, uh, and, and so I, I don't know what, what credit I'm going to take in my poetry for any of this. <laughs> because 
because I'm sure that the, it wasn't dependent upon the poem at all, but it just so happened that that, that poem was something. And, uh, and then finally I was told, oh, and you'd be interested in this, because the wife concerned, she's the one who first told me this, that, that he had awakened her a couple of nights ago during this thing. And uh, then she find, finally found out that, uh, uh, that uh, certain other people hadn't been told at all, but she, she, she said, uh, I don't know if my father-in-law knows, but you should tell him because he would be so proud, <laughs> proud of his son, <laughs> oh, awaking her in the middle of the night with this poem uh, and so forth. So I, that, that's okay with me. I, uh, I, I, <laughs> that's, uh, all the things you get to be known for, it's kind of ridiculous. And, uh, but, but I'd like to, I, I'd like to go from that myself to, of course, all of you talk a lot. And you're lots of people that you talk with. And, uh, and of course, sometimes I, I tell people, you know, if they want to learn how to write, listen sometimes when people are really angry and sometimes when they're really sad and when they're really just upset or when they're all mixed up. Because by God, then they get into all kinds of forms of expression and, and sound and their voices and it all. And in other words, uh, and, and then, then if you try to imitate it in some of your writing or just think in those terms, you might be immediately starting to write better lines than you thought you could write. And, uh, but uh, so as telling myself, you know, well, I went off to the University of Iowa and uh, after I'd hitchhiked to California, I'd gone to a, a, a JC there for $10 a semester. But uh, at any rate, back to University of Iowa. And uh, when I was there, I, was, uh, I, I went and told the speech teacher, I'm a little embarrassed about the way I talk. As I'd grown up in a Norwegian rural community in northern Winnishi County, about uh, 17 miles north of Decorah. And uh, almost all the people around me, the farmers, their wives, and so forth, many of them, they, they spoke uh, some Norwegian, and they, they used that Norwegian tone of voice. And so I, I, I went to the speech teacher and I, I said, I want to record my voice and, and see what it sounds like, because it sounds very, very funny to me that, at that point. And uh, so then uh, I asked her to help me to get rid of that. She said, forget it. Just forget it. Don't, don't be concerned about that. And. Uh, so I didn't didn't forget it, but there was a time later on when I would hear people say lines and phrases. They'd stay in my mind. And I, one that happened, I was graduating from Spring Grove High School, the senior. There was a, an elderly woman sitting on a porch across from the entrance to the high school. And I heard her say once, and she's talking about me and some other people, other fellows, yeah, they are so kind of restless. They always have somewhere to go. That's it. Now, I forgot that completely. This is 1934. In 1975, I was traveling from Oslo to Bergen, Norway, with my wife, and saw all the Norwegian rivers coming off the mountains. And, uh, and I just, uh, all of a sudden, those words hit me. Remember, I hadn't thought of it ever since 1934 to 1975. And some of you will remember, you know, that we have things like this, like you, something you smelled say, years ago, something you ate years ago, something you heard or, or such you saw years ago, and it, all of a sudden it strikes some kind of responsive tone in yourself. And uh, it was, this is the way it was. And then I thought, well, this is about, the, I can just put together the simple history of the transition of a lot of the early Norwegian or 
any immigrants, uh, if, uh, no matter what immigrant, can we just put it, but put it in the, in their voice, and uh, I have to t have to tell you too that uh, I don't have to tell you, uh, but uh, this has been printed as a broadside, and uh, because of the the appeal of the copying of the la language, not because of what it was said, because the history is nothing new, nothing. Uh, uh, it has been uh, printed at a broadside and sold in at least 5,000 copies around the country at various, various places. I, I, I apologize for even saying that because it'll make it sound it's, it's much more important than it is. But it, it's a point of the, there, here's this voice talking, and it, all it's telling is just the history of the transition of, of growth of immigrants from there to here. Nothing new, no new discovery in, in anything. Yeah, there's a kind of restless rushing around hills and tumbling the polished stones. They always have somewhere to go. Even when they pause in precipitous valleys, they climb into deep, long, cold lakes. See, they're just slowly rising. E-O-O-A. They climb into deep, long, cold lakes, and then again begin rapidly falling. See, I hope you heard that in the language. See, uh, uh, it, yeah, we have seen them pouring off mountaintops like the first dream of a second flood. And now, 100 blood years later, the amazed Norwegian-American travelers sailing the bird-like ferries or running through summer on the cliffhung roads with the sheer bravado of their origins. Yeah, now shall they see the affluent grandchildren, how proud and supple minds ran those rebellious rivers into the sea. And now, yeah, shall they hear the low music of springs watering those impoverished mountain meadows. Then let them guess, as they can, yah, how the terrible excitements of alienation rose in the manhood of our great-grandfathers and the playfulness of their children and broke in a heartbreaking cry from their limbs and washed from their empty hands. Yah, it was then, Stout in their sadness, they stuffed their childhood into rose-muller trunks, clamped them with iron bands locked once and for all on the eastern hemispheres, and down those rutted trails and noisy rivers, out through the western fjords, they rode for half a century over the Atlantic on one great ascending wave toward the virgin hills and the wide inland valleys of Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And now, yeah, even now, grandmothers sitting in their chalky rocking chairs and watching their children's children in Bergen and Decorah and Hardanger and St. Paul say half to themselves, yeah, they are so kind of restless, they always have somewhere to go. Hearing under their vaguely drooping eyelids the melancholy of those hard hills and those old stones and those rivers calling under the walled-up fjords to the muffled horns of the sea. Well, that there could be much more. You know, I, I was ashamed of uh, so the way, way I talked earlier. And finally, I, I learned to, to recognize, okay, this is something that was universal enough for all of us in, a, in whatever our backgrounds are. And, uh, and you can use them too. And you can, you can understand that in your own speech and in your own selves and in your own background, there's a whole history of, of just lovely possibility in music in the sound of what you speak. And I, I, that's one reason I'm here to talk at all as a poet is uh, I, in, in behalf of not just my sound, yours, uh, anyone's. Uh, I think I've, uh, 
I just may say one one more thing, a couple of things, and then I probably is it, then it would be time to just quit. But uh, at any rate, uh, I I should tell you that uh, I went. I had I had met uh, at a speech I gave in Oslo, Norway, at uh, a young man from Lapland, a, from the Sami group. He invited me to come up the next spring, and uh, which I did, uh, at, from where I was in Europe at that point, and uh, travel with him with 2,000 reindeer going across the mountains in northern Norway, way down to the Arctic Sea, so they could get there before the black flies took over the reindeers and uh, destroyed their, their make-believe. Somewhere in all that process, it, I wasn't equipped for it. Uh, he had brought, uh, Aslan Gulf was my friend there, the, the, the Sami. He had broken his leg while I was flying to Oslo. And uh, so he was not there, and, and I was traveling with just uh, Norwegian ski riding clothes up to travel with all these reindeer and a couple of families leading them to the Arctic. And uh, uh, so uh, he, he couldn't accompany me, uh, me and, and I had some pretty amazing, horrific experiences, and some were absolutely marvelous ones also, too, such as riding up a mountainside uh, way, way in North Norway, with a long rope, I was put on a sled uh, with one with a reindeer and 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 then the ski mobile, and leading the the leading deer with bells, and then six other bells, uh, deers with bells right behind them, and then two thousand deer running up the mountainside in in the morning sunlight. The sunlight was coming along the horizon, and then. And, and just leading the whole thing and hearing those bells and it, it, it clear weather. It's one of the pure, lovely moments in my whole life. About six days later, after some other experiences I could tell you about, but it's, uh, it's useless. Uh, but uh, one of the Laplanders took me way out in the mountains and abandoned me. He meant for me to die. And, uh, I was left there for I, I, for about six hours by myself, and, but I stayed where I was because I didn't know anywhere to go, none. And I was scheduled to be, two weeks later I was scheduled to be giving the commencement address at Luther College. And the first thing I said to myself was, well, maybe this is it, but I'll see what I can do. Well, there wasn't anything I could do. And, uh, and then, then the second thing I said, how am I ever going to be able to tell Luther College that I probably won't make it? <laughs> and and, uh, and that's what I said. And I was more worried about not being able to k keep my appointment than I was about my life at that point. I don't know I, why, I don't know why. There's nothing heroic or courageous in me. It's just a situ situation. And uh, I wrote, uh, uh, I had all sorts of experiences, but of course I, I've told a number of people. I've spoken before the Sons of Norway. I did recently at the, at uh, Red Wing, Minnesota, and uh, just telling them about this and then saying a, a poem I wrote as, uh, as at the end of it. But uh, time is just going on too far, and uh, so I and. Um, among my experiences, see, the Laplanders, they, they wore reindeer robes and the button around their, their neck and then they, they spread out. When they had to go to the toilet, remember the temperature would be about zero or below zero up in that area, 350 miles north of the polar circle. Uh, they'd spread it out, like a, sit down like a tent for their toilet so forth. Uh, and of course, I had just the uh, Norwegian ski equipment, and I had to uh, pull off, uh, you know, pull my pants down. And, uh, and every time I had to go to the uh, toilet like that, uh, the temperatures below zero or zero, uh, bare assed, as I said. <laughs> uh, and and uh, that's, uh, but that is just 
part of the whole whole thing somehow. But, and so when I spoke at uh, at the Red Wing, I, of course I told them about this, what I told you. It's, so the uh, the officers of the Sons of Norway, we had the Red Wing, Minnesota. They they liked they liked the the idea of the whole story of this this sort of thing, and so they got together and wrote a, a little limerick for me. I I've saved it. Uh, they, it's, I've written poems for others, including Robert Frost. But uh, this is the poem they wrote for me, which they were celebrating the next morning. We're all getting to bre for breakfast. And they read it, and this is, this is the, the limerick they wrote. There once was a poet named Joe who went up to Lapland, you know. He ran deer with the Sami far from Miami and froze his ass in the snow. <laughs> so so, so you, 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 see, uh, you see where poetry can lead you. Uh, but.